Hello everyone, my name is Pietro and today I'm happy to lead you in a visit to one of the most beautiful buildings in Genoa, Palazzo Angelo Giovanni Spinola. The palazzo was built between 1558 and 1564 on an original design by Giovanni Poncello, who was commissioned by Angelo Giovanni Spinola, banker to King Charles V of Spain and one of the richest men in the world at that time. Thanks to his incredible wealth, he was able to build this magnificent palazzo. Unfortunately, however, he died in 1560 before construction work was completed, leaving the site to his eldest son, Giulio, whom we see here depicted with winged victory. We are now in one of the most beautiful atria in the city. The paintings and frescoes are attributable to the brothers Aurelio and Felice Calvi and date from the end of the 16th century. In a central position, framed by an octagonal vault, the painters have depicted the battle of Gerardo Spinola against the Florentines. Gerardo was lord of Luca and Tortona, and this battle was considered one of the greatest victories of the Spinola family. A number of other victories are depicted in the vestibule. The scene is surrounded by eight allegorical figures of the moral virtues, representing the qualities of the Spinola family, such as Christian faith and eternal glory. The side walls of the atrium represent a sort of pantheon of the Spinola family, where some of the illustrious members of the family are depicted, such as Alberto and Galeotto Spinola, leading Genoese figures from the 13th and 14th century. We're now reaching the heart of the palazzo, the first noble floor. This is the reception room, where foreign guests to the palazzo were welcomed, and where public dinners and parties were held. It is easy to appreciate the uniqueness of this beautiful hall thanks to the fresco decorations that cover both the vault and the side walls. The frescoes are the works of members of the Semino family, who were greatly admired throughout northern Italy at the end of the 16th century, as is demonstrated by their frescoes in Palazzo Marino in Milan. Here, the simple decoration of the side walls and the play of perspective of the colonnade that frames the landscape enlarge the actual spatial ratios, giving the impression of a much wider room. Here, the main attraction is the vault that is decorated with iconic events from the life of Alexander the Great. The central scene depicts the meeting with the Queen of the Amazons, Telestri, the famous episode in which the Virgin Queen, conquered by the beauty of the Macedonian king, gives herself to him, the only man she could ever fall in love with. Other stories follow. The young Alexander who tames the horse Bucephalus, the Battle of Issu, and the defeat of Darius, king of the Persians. The meeting between Alexander and the Queen of Karyada. Alexander's journey to India, with the meeting of the Brahmin Kalano, the meeting with Aristotle, where the philosopher asks Alexander to rebuild his native city, Stagira, the meeting with the cripples, the meeting with Diogenes, the meeting with the pontifex of the Jews. But why did Julius Spinola decide to decorate the main hall of his palazzo with the story of Alexander the Great? Alexander was considered a model for his valour in battle and fame as a king, as evidenced by the various episodes depicted. But he represented also, and above all, a model for the moral virtues of generosity and humility, such as before the cripples, and of respect for religion, as shown by the episode of the meeting with the Jews, where Alexander leaves freedom of worship in the newly conquered land. These moral qualities are flanked by the skill of good government. This is highlighted by the depiction of the episode of the Gordian knot. Alexander, in the presence of a knot said to be impossible to untangle, cuts the rope in two with his sword, illustrating the ability to make the right decision at the right time. 
In fact, the Spinola family, like Alexander, had to be strong in battle, but at the same time, generous, humble and understanding in rule. The same themes inspired Bernardo Castello in the beautiful fresco in the anteroom, where the scene of Alexander's clemency towards the family of King Darius is depicted. After the Battle of Isso, the Macedonian king, instead of killing the defeated royal family, welcomed them to his court. Here he is shown with Darius's mother, Sisigambi. This allegorical fresco expresses the human dimension of Alexander, and therefore metaphorically, of the owner of the house. Particularly interesting is the style of the painting, which represents an important stylistic evolution compared to the Mannerist frescoes by Semino. Castello simulates a sort of curtain above our heads, creating perspective and giving volumetric depth to the scene. It was completed in 1592, as is shown by the inscription on the portal. After having admired the marvelous frescoes depicting the main protagonist of the Hellenistic Age, the side salons offers a beautiful overview of Roman history by Bernardo Castello. This is the living room dedicated to the story of Octavius. In the center, the triumph of Octavius, who, after defeating Antony and Cleopatra, enters Rome, while on the side walls we have the Battle of Actio and the subsequent surrender of Antony, then Cleopatra's Ark, Cleopatra witnessing Antony's suicide, and finally the meeting between Octavius and Cleopatra and the suicide of Cleopatra with the snake biting her breast. The Palazzo is one of the most intact in terms of the number and quality of its frescoes, as well as the layout realized by its new owners which makes the site extremely fascinating. The eastern salons house the scenes of Octavius, Antony and Scipio by Castello, while on the west side, another painter, Lazzaro Tavaroni, was employed. In fact, four different artists worked here, demonstrating the cultural importance of the palazzo. In the former living room, we can admire the clash between Caesar and Pompeo. Here, there is the admiral triumph of Caesar, who arrives in Rome ready to be appointed emperor, while on the side walls are shown his slow decline until his death at the hands of his son Brutus.